turn now? Yeah. OK, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the outline of the four talks. So today we'll discuss uh, SYK-like models and uh, techniques to deal with the large hand limit. So this talk will be a little more technical. Then uh, lecture two will discuss some of the features of the low energy limit of this model and some interesting aspects about it. Uh, that uh, has some a more conceptual aspects. Uh, then in lecture three, we'll discuss some aspects of near extremal black holes and the dynamics of gravity for near extremal black holes. Um, and again, some simplifications that happen here that mirror the ones we had in lecture two. And finally, in lecture four, I will talk about some other models for black holes, which are based with deep on deep brains and certain <coughs> matrix models. Uh, I'll, this is also one example of uh, gauge gravity duality and that has some uh, features which are slightly different than the standard ADS-CFT. And that's why I'm discussing this. And there are also some other interesting aspects about this, this theory. OK, so um, I mean, I'll, be, I'll be here the whole week. So if you see me, you can ask me questions about either this or any other topics. And uh, I, uh, if uh, you prefer me to talk about something else, tell me. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, so what are the motivations for uh, this SYK model? Um, first is uh, one virtue is that it's a simple solvable model. Um, and it can be used to study uh, quantum chaos, thermalization, and transport for strongly coupled theories. So it has the feature that is uh, strongly coupled, but also solvable. And it also uh, displays <coughs> a kind of quantum chaos. And so normally, uh, chaotic pro systems are not uh, solvable. Now, this model is not completely solvable. It's just only solvable in large and limit. Um, and nevertheless, it uh, displays some chaotic properties that we will discuss. Um, in some ways, it's uh, similar to motion. In hap so you might, you might wonder why you can have a model which is both chaotic and solvable. And an example of something uh, roughly like this is motion in hyperbolic space. So if you have a particle mo moving in hyperbolic space, uh, it will, uh, so two nearby trajectories will start uh, moving away from each other. So uh, that's a signature of chaos that uh, nearby initial conditions lead to very different outcomes. Um, but well, it's a solvable model because you can, uh, because of the symmetries of hyperbolic space, you can actually solve what's going on. Um, so in that sense, it's similar. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to say it's identical to that. We'll, we'll see some similarities. Um, and so that's uh, one interesting aspect. And for, for these reasons, it was studied in, uh, in condensed matter theory. So it was introduced by uh, Serge de Venier, for example, to study um, as a model, toy model for uh, strongly interacting electrons. But some of our recent interest on this is due to some uh, similarities that were noted by Kitayev with uh, near extremal black holes. Well, actually, they were also noted by Sashde, but um, he mentioned them, but we, they fell on deaf ears. We didn't understand wh what he was talking about. But then, uh, Sashde, um, then Kitayev did more computations and uh, made this relationship more clear, and in addition, simplified this model. And so it has uh, the, the nice aspect is that it has a, an interesting pattern of uh, symmetries and emergent symmetries and symmetry breaking and so on um, that uh, is common with uh, near extremal black holes. So it's, uh, it's a step towards understanding uh, sort of uh, nearly ADS2 uh, spaces and nearly CFT ones. So this we are trying to understand what that means. Um, OK, so that uh, is part of the motivation for uh, studying the models we'll discuss in the first uh, couple of lectures. OK, so before I, I even discuss the model, I would like to uh, explain more or less where it sits in the landscape of uh, somewhat simple models or large hand models. So um, it uh, sits somehow in the landscape of large hand models. So these are models that have uh, some number n, which is the number of fields or the number of variables. And sometimes they have some ON symmetry, sometimes they don't. Um, and so an example of this is the ON vector model. Uh, I think Igor either talked about this or will talk about this. Um, so this is a model. What? 
Both. Very good. So I don't need to explain to you what they are. Um, so model where you have n uh, fields, uh, typically with an O-N symmetry. And uh, if you had, a, for example, a field theory like this with a, let's say, 5 fourth interaction and so on, um, it might lead to a conformal field theory. And uh, it will have dimensions or energies. So this is dimensions or energies. And these interaction energies are of order 1 over n. Okay? So anomalous dimensions of uh, especially higher spin operators are of order 1 over n. And sometimes these models can be viewed as having a gravity dual. So, uh, and the gravity dual of these models is some uh, complicated uh, gravity theory called Vasiliev gravity. I'm not going to say anything about it other than the name, just in case you uh, find it. But it's uh, really, you should think of it as a theory where um, it's a theory of interacting massless higher spin fields. So in the same way that Einstein gravity is the theory where you have massless spin two fields, this is a theory where you have massless uh, all spin fields. So two, four, five, two, two, four, six, eight, etc. Um, so this model is relatively simple. The gravity dual is relatively complicated. Then uh, here near the bottom, uh, okay. Uh, can you see here on the bottom of the blackboard? Probably not. Yes, you can. Yeah, he can. So <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> it might be good to lift it up as you write. You can switch the board and have that one higher. Uh, well, there is a problem of uh, hiding what was called. Uh, no problem. I'll get used to this. Okay, so we'll have uh, the other type of large end theories are uh, gauge theories, for example, uh, gauge or matrix theories. Gauge or matrix theories. These are typically based on some UN or ON symmetry also, but the fields have two indices. And uh, examples are, for example, large end QCD or n equal to 4 super young mills and so on. And in some particular cases here, for example, n equal to 4 super young mills, we can take the, cup, the dimensions and uh, the energies much, might be uh, much bigger than 1. So more precisely, what I mean is that the anomalous dimensions of higher spin field can become uh, much bigger than one. And typically, we see that when that happens, also they have Einstein gravity duals. By Einstein gravity, what I mean is a theory of intera interacting massless spin two particles, uh, weakly coupled. Uh, the coupling is given by. So all these theories are weakly coupled, and their couplings are 1 over n. Um, but um, in this uh, in this case, the theory is also uh, local theory, and um, well, it's the standard Einstein gravity action, um, dominated by the second derivative terms in the action. Okay, and then uh, so the SYK somehow SYK like, uh, and uh, the tensor models that uh, I think Igor is either talked or and or uh, we'll talk about. Uh, I sit here in the middle, and they have anomalous dimensions typically, which are of order 1. Um, and they have some gravity dual, which uh, we don't know what it is. Okay? Um, so that's, uh, so they sit somehow in complexity between the vector models, which are simpler, and uh, planar. Uh, so these are planar diagrams. <coughs> And these are these are rise, give rise to strengths and so on. And it, th these are not very easy to sum, and they've been only summed in very specific models and uh, some very simple cases. And these are somewhat easier to sum, so they are somewhere in complexity. You see that uh, the anomalous dimensions are also somewhere somewhere in between the two extreme cases. Um, of course, here we can have things like uh, large NQCD, where again uh, an interaction energies are also further one. Um, okay, so uh, let me uh, now talk a bit more about this SYK example. Um, so it's uh, so some um, so in this in this particular example we have a Hilbert space. So this is the Hilbert space, not the Hamiltonian, uh, which is generated by uh, 
uh, Majorana fermions. So we have n Majorana fermions that go from 1 to n. So Majorana fermion, anti-commuting fermionic field, uh, its uh, adjoint is equal to itself. Um, and so you can uh, think of this Hilbert space as uh, generated by n over 2 qubits. Um, Roughly the qubits are, uh, each pair of fermions uh, will form uh, qubit operators, and um, so and so on. So I'll, I'll be more explicit in a second. So we have the anti-commutation relations uh, given in this form. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, psi dagger is equal to psi. And theory of fermion has uh, always a, an operator, which is minus 1 to the f. Which, um, um, well, who's, uh, which acting on psi gives minus psi. Okay. So that's uh, this essentially theory, theory of fermions. Um, and I like to remind you the relationship to ordinary qubits and so on. Uh, this, these are probably things that you might know. Uh, do you all know them? You know the Jordan Wigner transformation? Might be useful. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's uh, analyze what this is for n equal to 2. Okay? It's just a particular example. So we have two fermions. And we can think of uh, the first fermion. So it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So the first fermion is sigma 1. And the second fermion is uh, yeah, second fermion is sigma 2. Okay? And then minus 1 to the f is, could be viewed as uh, psi 1, psi 2, or sigma 3. Okay? That's easy. So now uh, we do n equal to 4. Okay, so we'll do this uh, step by step. So we have psi 1 and psi 2, we could just take them to be the same, right? And then we'll have psi 3 and psi 4. Um, and then in order for psi 3 and psi 4 to anti-commute with this, so we'll put the sigma 3 matrix here, right? Um, and then we'll uh, now have a Hilbert space dimension, which is twice, uh, well, which is, um, yeah, twice what it was before. So we have another factor. And uh, so we're going to, in that Hilbert space, we'll define this as uh, sigma 1 tensor 1, and then this will be sigma 3 tensor sigma 1, sigma 3 tensor sigma 2, OK? And in this way, we can go on, right? So now, what, what am I supposed to do for psi 5 and psi 6? So to make them anti-commute with these two, we keep the sigma 3 matrix here, but we also need them to, make, to be anti-commuting with these two, so we put another sigma 3 matrix, right? And then again sigma 1 and sigma 2. <coughs> okay? And then, uh, well, in this way we can uh, go on, right? So you, you, you got the idea. Yeah. Um, minus 1 to the f is uh, the product of all of these guys, and ends up being the product of all the sigma 3s. Okay. Um, good. Now, so this is, uh, so the psi's generate the Hilbert space, and we can think of all the operators in the Hilbert space as just products of fermions. So if we have a generic operator, it will be a linear combination of operators which will contain psi 1 to some power s1, which could be either uh, 0 or 1, then psi 2 to the s2, so s2 could be 0 or 1, and so on, right? So in this way, we can uh, write down all the operators in a simple way. In a certain sense, I mean, we might be interested in fermions, but also uh, these Majorana fermions are like the simplest way to think about the uh, large Hilbert space. Or it's a little simpler than thinking in terms of qubits, because for qubits, if I wanted to write down all the operators, I have to keep track of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 for each, for each lot. Right? Here, it's a little slightly simpler. But conceptually, it's very similar. Um, now, one comment here is that you might have seen uh, this type of construction as uh, construction of higher dimensional gamma matrices. Um, or uh, you might also have seen it uh, in, um, for a spin chain uh, when you uh, go between the, the sigma variables of the spin chain and the fermionic uh, variables. That's, uh, that's how Jordan and Wigner originally were doing this. So for example, for the Ising model, uh, this is a transformation you do to argue you have a fermion. Um, okay, so um, as I said, the dimension of the Hilbert space um, uh, of H is 2 to the n over 2. Okay. 
Yeah, and it's exponential in n as you. Okay, first uh, I'm going to first talk about a model which is not as well. It's a simple model, uh, even simpler model. It's almost a free theory, but it has uh, one uh, interesting feature. So. <coughs> that I'll try to point out. So this is, uh, if you wish, a side comment parenthesis. This will not be about SYK, but about the simpler model. Um, but it, it has some of the features of, of the model, more complicated model we're going to discuss later. So we can choose a Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, some Mij's uh, times Ij I, Psi J, right? So a generic uh, quadratic Hamiltonian. Um, so here we could choose these m's to be an anti-symmetric matrix, and um, the i is here to make the Hamiltonian Hermitian. Okay, so we could have that. So then uh, we could choose this uh, this matrix as random. So we have a random matrix, um, and we can then diagonalize this matrix, and we'll get uh, so minus. So it's a diagonal matrix. So it will be that we'll, we'll have eigen anti-symmetric matrix. We have eigenvalues. Well, we can not diagonalize it, but let's say reduce it to two by two blocks, where we have m1, m2. Of course, we can also diagonalize it, but it's slightly simpler to think about this way. So then we are um, grouping the fermions in pairs, right? So after we diagonalize, we do a general Owen transformation. We have now the new first and second fermion are paired this way. So uh, that's given this first qubit different energies for the up and down spin. Okay, so very simple story. Um, okay, so the new Hamiltonian, so after we diagonalize the new Hamiltonian, it's just simply i uh, sum over i, uh, well, let me call it uh, m1 psi 1 psi 2 plus m2 psi 3 psi 4, etc. Right? Um, yes? So if there were like n of those chromionic fields, we would have n fields. Uh, well, a a n Majorana fermions correspond to n over 2 qubits. Okay, so if I wrote down the Hamiltonian as like some m i j k l psi i psi j psi j psi l, and then would be. How many indices does your m have? I mean, like, uh, if we had like four fermions. Well, that we'll get to that there. Let's let's do this case first. Um, you you'll get tired of the other one. I guarantee. Um, so, <coughs> okay, so the, the spectrum of this Hamiltonian is just simply uh, the, we could have plus or minus m1, plus or minus m2, etc. right? So it has a relatively simple spectrum, which is the sum of these numbers. So the numbers are the eigenvalues of a random matrix, so they are distributed roughly as the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Um, so if we say how many, so this is the number of eigenvalues, and this is the eigenvalue. So we have more eigenvalues for small values. And let's say we start having less eigenvalues for larger values. So we have some random matrix-like distribution. I think Igor probably discussed this uh, random matrix uh, distribution. But we have a relatively simple Hamiltonian, where, the, ham where the, the Hamiltonian is equal to the sum of these numbers. In particular, the energy levels are going to be sort of Poisson distributed. There is no eigenvalue repulsion and so on. Um, OK. so. And the one uh, feature I wanted to point out that will be useful for lecture number two is that uh, if we focus on, um, so here, uh, well, I, I drew the eigenvalues. Of course, they are paired, uh, the plus and minus. And so for each eigenvalue, uh, we can forget about the negative ones. And for each eigenvalue, we have two states, the occupied and the unoccupied state. Um, and so when we consider excitations, we can consider this as the excitations of the system. So we can excite the first, uh, let's say, the, the first eigenvalue or the second and so on. Right? Um, I mean, I, I drew this as continuous, but the, the m's come in some discrete uh, discrete values. Right? Now, in the Russian limit, this is almost continuous. And this is an almost constant. So a low energy is an almost constant distribution of uh, energy, right? Um, almost constant distribution of eigenvalues. So it means that we have one eigenvalue per unit of m. right? And that's the same that you have if you have um, a, um, a fermion field in one plus one dimension. So if you have a fermion field in one plus one dimension, um, so you imagine you had uh, fermions on a big circle of radius r. So then uh, their energies would be equal to the momentum, uh, let's say some momentum quantum number, like, let me call it n, divided by r, right? 
And so in this case, they would be equally spaced. In this case, they are not equally spaced. But you still have a density which, in the limit that r is very large, is essentially constant. We have something similar. And so here, the spacing between these eigenvalues is of order 1 over n. And so in the, um, in the limit that, the, that capital N is very large, so n, n is much bigger than 1, so this effective r is uh, roughly like n. And so we get something that is, roughly speaking, like a massless field in an infinitely big space. So we have a continuous uh, spectrum and uh, a scale invariant uh, spectrum, as we have in a 1 plus 1 dimensional uh, massless field. OK? Is that uh, clear? OK, so we started from some. So this is a very simple example where we start with a, uh, a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom. And we have some kind of uh, scale invariance in the infrared, approximate scale invariance. Of course, if we go to extremely low energies, we'll see that there is one minimum eigenvalue, and that's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we're imagining we fix them, and then we look at the spectrum. Of course, if you start moving m, this will move. Yeah. OK, but the dynamics of this model is uh, also very simple, because um, even so the, if you start with one of the fermion fields, even the original fermion field, and we act with the Hamiltonian, this uh, fermion field will be transformed in a sum of a linear combination of the other fermion fields, but we'll always have one fermion field. So we'll never have like a product of two fermions or three fermions and so on. So the, the evolution of the operators is very simple. So this is, uh, this is an integrable model. Okay? So this is not SYK, but uh, something different. OK. Um, this is just to talk about something simpler. So now, uh, since you were desperate to know what the one with four fermions was, so let's uh, write it down. So this was a model which uh, had couplings. Um, um, Of course, this J should not be confused with this J. I, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to confuse me. Um, um, so we have, um, we have random couplings again. But now the Hamiltonian has four fermions. Okay. So this will give it a more complicated dynamics, because once, if we start with one fermion and we commute with the Hamiltonian, uh, we'll start having operators that have, uh, let's say, three fermions. And then we commute it again, and we'll have more fermions, and so on. So the operator starts growing and becoming more complicated. Okay. Um, okay, but we'll not talk about that for the time being. Um, okay, so these random couplings, uh, we could take them in various ways, but it's uh, useful to take them to be just Gaussian variables, uh, it's all independently distributed. And as any Gaussian distribution is specified with, by the two-point function, and so we say that the two-point function, we're going to call it j squared, so it's the same for everyone. And we're going to put a factor of n uh, just for convenience. So we'll, this is just for convenience later. You'll see why this factor of n is convenient. Um, so here we imagine that uh, these j's are random but fixed. Okay, So you fix the j's once and for all, and then you study the dynamics of the model and so on. Right? Um, uh, there are simple generalizations where, so side comment, there are simple, simple generalizations where we put more indices here, J, K, L, M, R, right? And so we have all these operators and then also M, R, right? So we have six uh, fermions. And so we can have any number of fermions. And that's convenient sometimes uh, to, well, it's convenient because sometimes you can analytically continue in this number. But we'll see why you can do that later. Um, OK, one more thing. So um, the Majorana fermions, so these fermions are dimensionless in, uh, in 0 plus 1 dimensions, right? So, we, so the anti-commutation relations, right? It's uh, just a number. And, um, and so the dimensions uh, are of, the, of energy of the Hamiltonian come purely from J, the dimensions of J. So J is a constant of, with dimensions of energy. Okay. Um, so the whole spectrum of this Hamiltonian will be fixed in units of uh, this J. Okay. That would set the scale of the spectrum, but that's all it does. Um, now, the spectrum of this model, 
Uh, so I'm here, I'm not uh, explaining why we have these results. I'm just going to give you a preview of the results, and then we'll discuss some techniques that show that what I'm saying right now is uh, reasonable, it's correct, OK? But um, um, so the here, uh, it's equally likely to have a positive eigenvalue as a negative eigenvalue, because we didn't say anything about the sign of these j's. So if we had positive, we change the sign of all j's, it's also a possible random value for the couplings. So we expect that to have equal probability of having some eigenvalue here or some eigenvalue at the right. I'm not saying that they will be exactly degenerate, but the shape of possible eigenvalues will be statistically symmetric. Okay. Um, and it turns out that, uh, well, it, uh, it is some, some form that uh, roughly, let me, the precise form will, well, I'm very bad at drawing. I just argued that it should be symmetric, and I drew something asymmetric. But uh, you should just correct for that minor mistake. Um, OK, and then, uh, so it goes roughly between something that goes like minus j n times some number, uh, and then uh, plus j n times the same number. Right? So that's uh, how the distribution will look for, this is for large n, right? OK, so that's the typical distribution. Now, suppose you have two eigenvalues near each other, right? somewhere in between here. What is the spacing between these eigenvalues? What would you expect the spacing to be? How many eigenvalues do we? OK, let, let's start with a simpler question. How many energy eigenvalues do we have? What? Let's say n or 2 to the n. So what? How many people think it's n, and how many people think it's 2 to the n? 2 to the n? Raise the hand, the ones who think it's 2 to the n. OK, good. It's 2 to the n. <laughs> so, well, it's 2 to the n over 2, because we that's the dimension of Hilbert space. So it was, OK, minor error in the exponent, right, factor of 2. It's, as long as it's your, not your salary, it's not a problem factor. <laughs> um, OK, so um, so that's the number of eigenvalues. So the spacing is uh, will be min with a minus sign here. Right? So they are very closely spaced. Um, now, uh, in most of what we will do uh, in these talks and in these lectures and so on, we'll be concentrated on a, on a region roughly of further one size here, so some region here, where we are uh, considering an exponentially large number of eigenvalues. Okay. So we'll look at the end of the spectrum and consider a, a large number of eigenvalues. So that, that's a constraint on the type of energies we're going to look at, and so on. So if you look at or the, t the kinds of times we are going to be interested in. Um, so we'll later be a little more specific about that. Um, um. OK, so that's uh, the kind of thing. Th th those are the kinds of problems we're going to be interested in. OK, okay so we'll later see why uh, the spectrum has these endpoints and so on. That, that will be seen more clearly later. Uh, but you can, uh, you, you can take some r this Hamiltonian, you can put it on the computer, and you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And uh, for relatively small values of n, uh, like uh, 30 and so on is more than 32, I think. Well, I'm not sure exactly which is the largest value people considered, but of that order of magnitude, you can uh, draw this tri distribution and it looks more or less like this. Uh, but we will uh, also argue theoretically that for very large n, it should also look like that. OK, so now imagine we uh, consider some correlation function as a function of time, right? Um, so, for example, between two fermions, let's say psi 1, psi 1. Um, now, what are the time scales in this theory? So, we, um, yeah, we'll see that uh, for time scales which are very, very small, right, uh, we can ignore this Hamiltonian because we, um, the Hamiltonian has an sc energy scale of order j. Okay, so, for very small time scales, um, we can ignore. Uh, so the theory is essentially free. So it's even more than free. It's topological. Nothing. This correlator would not depend on time for these very long, small times. But then when the times get of order j, 
I mean, here I'm not arguing, I'm not proving that there isn't a factor of n, but we'll later see that there is no, no factor of n. Uh, it will become uh, more interesting, so there will be some interactions, and that's what we are interested in understanding. So in order to understand that, we'll uh, look at the uh, perturbation theory um, and analyze some of the diagrams. So let's uh, first talk about the the propagators. So the, this would be both the propagators at very short times and also the propagators if we had Hamiltonian equal to zero. So um, okay. So imagine so we have a fermionic field. Let's say T1 is bigger than T2. Uh, then uh, this uh, how how can we compute this? Well. Um, if let's first set T1 equal to T2, so if T1 is equal to T2, then we have, uh, let's say, this is Psi1, um, um, and uh, we use the anti-commutation relation, so we get Psi1 squared, and uh, therefore this is equal to 1 half. The 1 half comes because in the anti-commuter there are two factors. Um, okay, good. Uh, and that's fine. And, but we're going to be interested in, because we're going to do perturbation theory, we're going to be interested in considering the time order. Uh, it's useful to time order the operators. Um, and so the time order, so I'm not going to introduce, to write the, this T always, but uh, in all cases, but we're going to consider only time order uh, expectation values here. And time ordering is defined, okay, so let me, let me just define it carefully. So that this time ordering is equal by definition, so this is just the definition of time ordering. So we're going to put psi1 first um, when uh, t1 is bigger than t2, right? Uh, and then we are going to put uh, um, psi2 first when psi1 is equal, is less than t2, okay? When t1 is less than t2, so th this is when t2 is bigger than t1, right? So theta is the step function. So this is just the definition of uh, what the time order in is. And uh, with this definition and the remark we just made about this being a half, we can check that this is equal to 1 half the sine uh, of t1 minus t2. Okay? So this is just the sine function plus 1 when this is positive, minus 1 when it's negative. Um, very good. So that's uh, the simplest uh, <laughs> diagram, the free <laughs> diagram. And now we can consider the simplest correction to this model. Um, and so uh, we can have, uh, let's say we compute the psi1, psi1 correlator. And then uh, if we put just only one Hamiltonian, then we don't come back to psi1. So it will not be a correction to the psi1 correlator. So we need at least two insertions of the Hamiltonian. So we have this diagram. And we'll average uh, the result we get by uh, averaging over all so th this is this is a diagram for a quartic uh, fermionic theory. Um, so this is fermion number one, and these are j, i, j, k. Okay. So this could run over these various indices. Um, and then we have the couplings j, and we're going to uh, average over these couplings. So in principle, I told you that. Um, um, yeah. So in principle here, we could have uh, two insertions corresponding to two different couplings in the Hamiltonian, two different j's with different indices. But after we average over the couplings, only uh, the ones that have the same indices uh, will survive in this diagram, will give a non-zero answer. Okay? And so uh, we do this average over j. So the dotted line represents uh, somehow the two-point function of the j's taken with uh, that Gaussian. So here, at this point, we're treating j as an extra field. Okay? So imagine for the purposes of this discussion, I'll, I'll let her justify why this is reasonable. Uh, we're going to treat J as an extra field whose two-point functions are time-independent and equal to uh, what we see over there. Okay. Yeah. There, there is no summation. Oh, yes, yes, that's important. Thank you. So here there is no summation, right? Uh, so if we had... Yeah. So that's what, uh, that is what sets the indices to be equal here, that two-point function of the j's. OK, so now what is the size of this diagram? So we had uh, this uh, two-point function, as we define it to be there. It goes like n squared over n cubed. That's just the two-point function of the j's. That's the dotted line. And then we have to sum over these uh, three indices, right? 
and that gives us a factor of n cubed, and so this goes like j, okay, j squared. So that's the reason we introduced the factor of n there, okay, so as not to have a factor of n here. Um, and then we have to do the integral over time over these two points of things which are these signs and so on, and those are integrals over two times, so we'll get some answer which roughly will involve uh, j squared and products of time time squared or, or the temperature squared or, or the inverse temperature squared. So this diagram will go like uh, will contain terms j squared, t squared or j squared, beta squared where beta is the inver inverse temperature. Let's just for the sake of this argument think that we're doing this in Euclidean time where the Euclidean time is compact so that we are at uh, finite temperature. Okay, so that's uh, one diagram. Um, now, let's look at uh, other diagrams. Um, so there are other simple diagrams which are simply, which come from integrate, iterating the diagram we just made. And those diagrams will all go uh, like, uh, like j squared and will be independent of n, okay? So we could have diagrams uh, which, where we iterate them like this, right? So this is uh, one way we can iterate. But in any of these lines, we can also replace by some other bubbles like this, right? These are called melons. And, anyway. and then we could iterate it again, and again, iterate here, and iterate here, and so on, right? So those are, all those diagrams will be some function of j and time, and beta and so on, but independent of n. So they all contribute to the same order in the 1 over n expansion. And the point is that all other diagrams, which are not of this form, will uh, have a subleading contribution in the 1 over n expansion. So there are uh, subleading diagrams, uh, well, of different kinds. So for example, yeah, in, in all these, one thing I forgot to mention is the following. In all these diagrams, the j's are average within one of these bubbles, right? So these are the contraction of the j's, right? So like this, and then this one like that, and so on, okay? So each of these bubbles comes with three lines and a J contraction. Okay, so let's uh, do an example of a subleading diagram. So it will, be, it will have to have at least four vertices. Um, so we'll do again. So the diagram could be subleading because the contraction of the J's is, uh, forces it to be so. So for example, we can have a contraction of these two J's and then these two J's, right? Um, okay, so... Uh, maybe you can help me get all the indices straight. Um, do we want to do the counting? So let's say this initial index was i, okay? Um, so, uh, and then this will index j, k, l, okay? Uh, but then, uh, because we are contracting with this j here, the indices here have to also be um, the same, right? So let's say this one was i, j, k, l, okay? And so what we see is that we have a smaller number of sum over uh, these indices. And well, this, this could be i, j, k, l, and this index in the middle could be anything, could be, let's say, s, okay? And then this is also compatible with the contraction of these uh, couplings here. Um, okay, so what do we got? What, we, what, what did we get? So we get j uh, to the fourth over n to the sixth. That just comes from the powers of, uh, of I erased, but this came from the con from the dotted line contractions. And now we have a number of indices, which is n to the fourth, right? We have n cubed from here plus this extra one, okay? And this went like one over n squared, so it's suppressed. There are also some other diagrams that, that are suppressed by one over n, so really, I mean, I can, I can show you one, so it's like this. Uh, Anyway, you can uh, show as an exercise that uh, this guy uh, is suppressed by 1 over n, okay? Total lines like this. Uh, so that's exercise. Just do the, do the exercise. So, thanks. so it, it's useful to do it once at least. You, you, you see how the indices are, how this argument works. Okay. Now, um, Okay, so the structure of the diagrams here is uh, simple enough that we can uh, we can sum all the leading diagrams uh, using uh, some 
integral equations. And what I'm going to do now is to derive those uh, integral equations. So we saw that the diagrams have a certain iterative structure. So let's say call G the full propagator. And so it's uh, this, and then we divide it in one particle reducible pieces, right? Um, so here we cannot cut into another line. And so here, so this thing is uh, sometimes called the self energy, right? This is in general for any uh, theory, any perturbative theory you can uh, do this. So a full propagator is equal to the free propagator. Uh, so one over the free propagator mm, minus the self energy, okay? Um, and well, the, the free propagator is just the inverse, well, it's uh, what we saw over there. And what comes here is the inverse of the free propagator. And the inverse of the free propagator is uh, the thing that acting on the sine function that I had over there, it gives a delta function and just, that's just the derivative. So this is dt minus sigma, okay? Maybe with an i, I don't remember. No, maybe without an i. Um, yeah, without an i. Okay, so that's, uh, this you can do in any theory. Okay, there is no, nothing we used about this model here, except, well, the, what exactly the free propagator was. Uh, in Fourier space, so if we had a situation that is uh, translation symmetric, like for example, the thermal computation, then we would get, uh, we could calculate the uh, G of omega, and this would be one minus omega minus sigma of omega, okay? Just this is uh, very simple and diagonal in uh, Fourier space. Okay, so the simplicity of this theory comes from the fact, uh, of, comes from the expression for sigma. So sigma is, uh, is given by what? So we have one of those bubbles. So to lead in order, sigma is given by this. But then the full expression for sigma contains uh, the same thing here, but with the propagator G, okay? So here we have the propagator G given by this formula. And that would give us uh, the full sigma. Okay. This one is a little more convenient to write as uh, sigma of, let's say, there are the two times here of uh, T1 and T2, which is equal to um, J squared. This came from the contraction of the J's of the two endpoints um, times uh, G uh, T1 T2 cubed. Okay. And in a situation, again, with time translation symmetry, this will depend only on the difference of times. So this will be a sigma of uh, t equal to j squared g of t, where t is the difference of the two times, okay? And then these are the two equations we are supposed to solve, okay? okay. Um, so here we use translation symmetry. So this, for example, is appropriate for uh, calculating the solutions when we have the finite temperature situation. Okay, let's try to... Now, this is uh, slightly... This is not... We cannot solve these equations exactly, uh, analytically, I mean. Um, and because, you see, this one is simple in position space, and that one is simple in, uh, in Fourier space, right? So we would need... So in some sense, it's an integral equation. Well, it's not in some sense, it is an integral equation. Uh, um, okay, so let, let's uh, try to see what this would look like. So let me uh, define times in units of beta. So this is zero, and this is one. So the horizontal axis here is Euclidean time divided by beta, okay? So that's the horizontal axis. The, ver the vertical axis, I'm going to draw G of tau, okay? So first, uh, we'll do it at uh, zero j. So when j is equal to zero, so then this is one half here and is constant, okay? So that's uh, this uh, constant value. Uh, and that's the same as that sign. It doesn't look the same as the sign uh, because um, there is here this, this, this continuity of the sign is here. So the, the fermion comes here and then when it goes around the thermal circle, there is a minus sign due to the fact that we're at finite temperature for fermions. Then we come with minus, and that's the minus that, well, comes with the minus, and then we have the jump of the sign that we had there at tau equal to zero. Then uh, we put a little bit of j squared. So when j squared, uh, for small 
beta j squared. So when uh, j, j, j times beta is small, we can just do the first uh, two corrections. So we get something that uh, decreases uh, a little bit. And then as we increase uh, uh, beta j, we start getting something that uh, roughly looks like this. Okay. So this is roughly the overlap between the fermion at one time and the fermion at later times. What this formula is saying is that we started with the fermion and then we, we still get the same fermion. Here, this fermion is migrating to other operators, right? And so we are not getting the same fermion operator. It's getting s the contribution gets suppressed. So this is uh, beta j much bigger than 1, OK? Now, these calculations uh, and the derivation of this formula assume that n is much bigger than anything else, OK? So are they all, all this discussion is correct when beta Beta j can be anything, but it's much less than n. Okay, so when beta j is of order n, the one over n corrections to these diagrams will have to be included. Okay, and we are not going to do that for the time being. So we're going to be interested in uh, this type of regime where we uh, we consider either these uh, these temperatures or times where uh, this happens. Okay. Um, okay. Very good. Um, no. Um, okay, now I'd like to rederive this. So I'm going to rederive those two equations uh, using a slightly different uh, point of view, which is uh, also useful. And uh, first, I'm going to uh, remind you of the O-N case. So in the O-N case, the if we had, for example, a quartic O-N theory. I don't remember whether Igor already mentioned it to you, but the diagrams that contribute have the shape of bubbles. Did you mention this? <laughs> okay, but it doesn't matter because we're going to derive it. Uh, we're going to think about. So uh, now we're going to consider an ON model first. Um, this is a motivation. So this is a side remark. I'm not now talking about SYK. I'm talking about a simpler case, and then we'll go back to the SYK discussion. Yes. The diagrams we have yes. Four, like, yes. Yes. Yes, I will because this is causing some confusion. So I, J, K, L, J, M, R, S, T, right? This is some delta function of I, J, well, Delta, roughly speaking, well, it's delta I M, delta J R, delta K S, delta L T, and then you have to anti-symmetrize all the indices. Okay, so that's uh, that's what it is explicit. So it's something that really sets these indices to be equal. Up to, of course, the these are all anti-symmetric in the indices. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I didn't mention this. Yeah, this, this, uh, these pictures here, you can find them uh, by solving them numerically. So you take your interval, you divide it into you know some number of uh, segments and so on, and this becomes some matrix equations, and you can just uh, solve these matrix equations. What? G is antiperiodic in time. Yes. It that, yes. Uh, well, what is plotted is it is antiperiodic in time because um, it, it's a because when the fermion gets here, right, it gets a minus sign because we are the minus sign is antiperiodic, right? But then it has a discontinuity. So I mean, I, I could draw the same thing, but um, th this was a function of t1 minus t2, right? So if if we want to show show it's more explicitly antiperiodic, um, let's think of it as a function of t minus, let's say, some epsilon, OK? Um, and then as a function of t. So epsilon could be the one of the fermions, and t could be the second fermion, OK? And then we'll see what the function is. So the function uh, would, um, well, this, uh, we simply just uh, move this, right, by epsilon, right? So this was happening at epsilon. And here, what we get is minus uh, that picture, right? Well, I, I cannot invert it in my head too well. Artistic abilities are very limited. 
Okay, so uh, so when we go over the thermal circle, we jump from whatever value we have here to minus its value, right? And then when we get to tau equal to zero, there is a jump of uh, a half due to the anti-commutation relations of the fermions, right? Is, is, is it more clear now? The jump is at epsilon where the second fermion is. So this is, l let me be more clear about this. So this is a psi of t, psi of epsilon, right? So it's a function which is anti-periodic in this time, right? And it has at tau equal to epsilon this jump uh, which is uh, equal to one. So the, the amount of this jump should, should be one due to the anti-commutation relations because with the two different orderings, um, we are, uh, the difference between the two orderings is the anti-commutator. Is that more clear? Yes, so, so the, there, there are two jumps which are, have different origin, okay? Let me remove this. So this is, tau, this is time of order beta, right? This is tau, now, now the horizontal line, this is the time, uh, time of order beta which ha have a jump to minus itself, okay? Due to the anti-periodic boundary condition for the fermions, right? So that's one type of jump. Then we have here a jump of order one, but uh, no, for, uh, absolutely equal to one, that is due to the anti-commutation relations of the fermion, right? So the function has two discontinuities. We have two different origins, right? Now, for the purposes of drawing the graph, it's a little simpler to uh, somehow imagine this fermion is at zero, and then we just draw it from here to to here, and then it then it looks uh, more looks continuous. Is is that more clear now? Um, Okay, good. So now we'll discuss, go back to this uh, Owen case. Uh, so we're interested in calculating the path integral over many... So this is a standard um, calculation. Let's say, for example, it could be a 5-4 theory. Um, and then we have the rescaled uh, coupling. I'm going to call it lambda. And uh, then we have phi squared, all squared, right? So this is the original action we are going to try, whose partition function we're trying to calculate. And we are going to write an expression for this uh, partition function by doing a simple manipulation. So the first uh, manipulation will be to include uh, a Lagrange multiplier field. Let me see how we call it, alpha. Um, e to the integral. So the first term is the same. Um, and then uh, this term, we are going to write it as uh, n over lambda alpha squared. I'm, I'm being careless about the signs, but as an exercise, uh, you can put the signs correctly. Um, so we, uh, we, after we integrate out alpha, we get back uh, the original interaction. Okay. And now, so the the goal of the, the objective of we, we did this alpha with the objective of making this action quadratic, and now we integrate the phi's, and then we get at the end a functional integral over alpha, which has the form e to the minus. Um, um, n uh, one half of log of the determinant of the operator d squared plus plus alpha uh, plus n over lambda alpha squared. Okay, so this piece is just the determinant of the fu the functional integral over phi, right? And has a factor of n because there are n fields. And the nice thing that happened here is that. Uh, we get an overall factor of n, okay? So now, uh, when n is large, the functional integral over alpha can be, do, be done by saddle point or equivalent, equivalently, we can think of alpha as a classical field, okay? So we can mi minimize this action and solve the classical equations for alpha that come from minimizing this action, okay? And you can write down those equations. I'm not going to do it uh, explicitly here. And the, the result of doing this is uh, equivalent to the type of equations you get from um, summing uh, diagrams that uh, contain a bunch of bubbles. So the language of diagrams and the language of... And so these bubbles uh, are like, uh, roughly speaking, an effective particle, which is uh, given by the field alpha, created by the field alpha. 
Okay, so now we are going to do the same, but uh, for the SYK model. Uh, um, Now, the proper way to treat a model with disorder is to talk about replicas. And uh, if you ask me what those are, I'll explain. If not, uh, let's say that I'm going to simplify our problem, and we're going to treat uh, the couplings J as an extra field which, uh, with correlators which are independent of time. Um, OK, so uh, we are interested in doing the functional integral deep psi of uh, some action which uh, has the form dt uh, i. So this is the action for the n uh, Marana fermions. Um, so this action has the, the property that when you calculate the momentum conjugate to psi, you get uh, psi again. And so that's why you reproduce the anti-commutation relations we had before. Um, and then uh, we have uh, the term in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so we have this term in the Hamiltonian. Uh, J is constant, independent of time. These are all time-dependent variables. The psi's are time-dependent. Um, and then uh, what we would like to do ideally is to well. And now we're going to do the average, uh, the functional integral over J, uh, and we're going to put a Gaussian factor. So dJ e to the minus, uh, let's say, j squared over its two-point function, which was uh, capital J squared over n cubed. Okay? So this is a Gaussian factor for the couplings j. They are independent of time. And that's what we would like to do. So w first, we're going to evaluate this quantity. As I mentioned uh, very briefly, this is, not exact, this is not the correct way to do the average over couplings. But for this model, it turns out to be uh, reasonable. And if you want, uh, you can ask me like that. Um, OK, so uh, we now, um, what do we do? So the first thing we can do is we can integrate out j. So the integral over j is Gaussian. So we integrate, out, integrate j. And then now we get an integral deep psi. Uh, so we get uh, the same term here in the action. And uh, from that integral over j, we get a double integral in time, because the j's are time independent. And this included an integral over time. So let me write it like this, integral dt. Um, and, um, and so we get a double integral. And then we get psi, some, a term that is roughly uh, psi to the fourth times uh, psi of t prime to the fourth. Okay? And the indices are contracted between these two. Is that notation clear, or should I be ma make it more clear? Is it clear to everyone? More clear, please. Yeah. Psi i, psi j of t, psi k of t, psi l of t. And then same thing, psi i of t prime, psi j of t prime, and so on. Right. So that's uh, what we have. Um, or uh, we could also rewrite this as the integral deep psi dt of, let's say, psi i of t, psi i of t prime, all to the power 4. OK, um, Okay, very good. So that's, uh, that's what we got. And then here, uh, we had this term. So now uh, we'll uh, come to this blackboard, and we will uh, write uh, 1. We'll introduce a 1 in that uh, functional integral. Um, Um, okay, so this one, uh, so we're going to write one, which is will be the integral, uh, d, um, let me call it d, d, uh, g tilde, okay? g tilde is a function of two variables, of delta of uh, g tilde of uh, t t prime, minus uh, psi i of t psi i of t prime. Okay. So here, here we are summing over the indices i. And so we integrate over g, and we just get 1, because delta function clicked 1. Okay. 
Um, okay, and now we rewrite this uh, delta function as the integral d sigma tilde, d g tilde. Um, I have still 15 minutes, right? Uh, uh, minus uh, one. Uh, well, I forgot to put the one over n. So, psi i psi i. So all of these are functions over two times. So these are integrated over t, t and t prime. Okay. So we add this term to to the functional integral, and that uh, we are adding a one. Okay. Now the the reason to do this is to uh, replace this uh, quartic term that we had here, okay? Uh, we're going to replace it by this uh, g tilde to the fourth power, okay? So we are essentially doing the same steps that we did before for the O-N theory, right? Uh, so this, uh, this step is somewhat similar to the step that we did here. Um, and so uh, we'll now, um, let me see, so... Uh, Okay, so what, what are we going to do? So we're going to insert this in the path integral. We are going to replace this by g tilde, okay? So now the fermions will appear quadratically. We'll have this quadratic term in the fermions and also this quadratic term in the fermions here, okay? Is everyone with me? Yes? And now uh, we just integrate the fermions. So that will give us a determinant. So a partition function now is going to have a d sigma tilde, d uh, g tilde. And so there are n fermions, so the term with the determinant, uh, um, to be precise, is a Fafian, uh, because it's an anti-symmetric matrix. Um, so we have, this is uh, the result of doing the integral over the fermions, right? So this came from this term, right, sigma tilde, and we had the kinetic term uh, gave us this factor. And then the rest uh, gives us uh, the factors uh, we had before, and um, these factors uh, contain um, d tau 1, d tau 2, and then sigma tilde times g tilde minus uh, j squared divided by 4, So here I've, I've inserted uh, the proper, uh, well, some convenient factors of some convenient minus signs and, and factors of uh, four. Okay, so what do we have now? So now we have uh, an integral, a functional integral over uh, these functions, but we don't have n functions. We just have uh, two functions, right? Um, and we have an overall n in the effective action, so we can uh, treat now uh, these variables as classical, right? And we can consider the first order approximation, which will be to minimize this action on these classical variables. And um, that minimization will reproduce those equations. So let me just quickly show how that is done. So if we calculate the equation of motion for sigma tilde, we take a derivative of sigma tilde with this, that will give us a g. T g and the derivative of this will give us, because there is a log here, we'll have a 1 over this thing, right? And that's uh, the first equation over there, okay? Is that clear? No? Yes? Um, and then uh, the other equation comes from varying g, so we vary g here, we get sigma tilde equal to g cubed, and that's the second equation, okay? So that shows also that that's the... Um, uh, those were the leading diagrams. We didn't forget any other diagram and so on. So this is an alternative derivation, right? So this is an alternative derivation for the leading order in n solution. So I'm, and I, I, haven't, I have given you two alternative derivations of those equations, okay? Is that clear? So one more from a functional integral point of view and the other one uh, from a more diagrammatic point of view. Um, okay, so a bunch of things to remark about this. Uh, Factor of n means it's classical. Um, now, originally we had n functions of one variable. The fermions were functions of one variable. But these g's and sigmas are functions of two variables. Okay. So, uh, in, in a certain sense, we are getting an extra dimension, right? So th those fermions lived only in time. This, this live in two times. Okay. Um, uh, 
Uh, now I change the not I, I notice that here uh, I put the tilde here to mean that here this sigma tilde and so on are variables of integration. And I didn't put the tilde over there to emphasize that those are the solutions of the equations of motion. So the, the, the g's without the tildes are the actual solutions which obey that equation. This, of course, when we are doing the functional integral here, they don't obey any particular equation. Um, now, suppose that we find the solution, like uh, we found over there, this uh, we can find numerically, like those plots that we have over there. We can take those solutions and plug them back into the action. So we plug them here back into the action. And what, we, what will we get? So we'll get uh, something that uh, has the form e to the minus n, or e to the n, well, makes sense. Um, well, n times some function of uh, j times beta. So for the finite temperature solution, <coughs> uh, after we do that, we'll get um, a function of j beta. So j beta specifies which of the curves we have over there. Right? So we get one unique curve. We put it in this action. There is an overall n. So we get n times some function of uh, j beta. Um, OK, and this, um, y if you think a little bit about this, uh, you realize that well, many so many of the features of the spectrum uh, come from of the spec of the, sh the general shape of the spectrum that I showed you before come from this uh, particular form of the function of the partition function. Um, so, for example, if you um, yeah, well, no, let me know. No. We'll see some some of those features a little later. So, roughly speaking, here uh, we should think well. What I'm going to say is not precise. I mean, this is just an analogy. So here, sigma tilde and g tilde are like the bulk of ADS-CFT, right? So they look like the bulk. And uh, they, ha they live in one more variable. They are classical variables. Um, now, that's, those are some things they have in common with the bulk of ADS-CFT. But one thing they don't have in common is that the action is non-local in these other variables. So these terms are perfectly local in this T1 and T2 space. Um, but this term is uh, non-local, okay? um, and we don't recognize here this the space of T1 and T2 is not equal to well not equal so far to ADS space and so on. Uh, it's equal to something we'll call uh, we can call kinematic space, which is the space of two points on the ADS boundary, for example, or two two times. Um, okay, however. Um, some derivation like this is an, I an ideal of how we would like to understand, at some point in the future, we would like to understand uh, the examples we know about gauge gravity duality by a derivation like this, so where we uh, start from the original Lagrangian and then do some changes of variables, and we end up with the bulk theory. Okay? So I'm just, uh, of course, here we, this, this is not a gravity, standard gravity theory, but this is an objective of what we would like to do for other cases. Um, and it's something we can do in this case that we cannot do in other cases. Um, now, everything that we said here generalizes to higher dimensions, uh, theories of bosons, and so on. So, well, not everything, but thi this, this derivation that we have here um, could have been done if the psi's were bosons, or if the, the kinetic term, instead of ha being like this, was quadratic, or we had extra dimensions here. I mean, we had, uh, let's say, d dimensions. It would have been, this action would have been essentially the same thing, except that here we integrate over 2D dimensions. Okay? Is that, that clear? No? Yep. So T is replaced by some X that lives in D dimensions, and then G of T1 and T2 is G, G of X1 and X2 lives in a 2D dimensional space. But then the rest is the same story. Yes, yes, yeah, so, okay, so there is, uh, this, this derivation only, as far as we discussed, depends uh, only on the structure, this large end structure. Now, the particular details of the model depend on uh, what action you started from. So, depending on the action you started from, this, I don't know, you come here and then it might be ill-defined, it might be, have negative modes and so on. Um, I mean, here, if you started with this action and you changed the sign of lambda, for example, this would not be perhaps a well-defined theory, and you might see some sickness or some problem. Um, or if you are in, depending on the number of dimensions you are in, this 
action might have some interest in infrared behavior or not, or be non-renormalizable. So those are some details you have to analyze, but you, you can analyze them all within the large end, this large end, uh, large end structure. Um, no, that in principle might not be the case. Yeah. So well, let's see. Let's discuss. Uh, the, the argument that they decouple is the same, uh, but uh, again, there is the issue that Igor discussed of uh, whether there are ne ne more negative modes and so on. Um, let me quickly discuss the replica. Well, let me see. I have four minutes, so well, I have to make a little choice. So. Um, well, um, uh, if I spend all my time making the choice, all replicas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know where the replicas. Um, so replicas is something that uh, normally high energy physics we don't uh, discuss too much because we think the Lagrangian of our universe is fixed, but maybe it's not fixed. Maybe we have all random couplings. Um, uh, but uh, it's a technique that is. Well, certainly in condensed matter physics and so on, it's useful to think about this. Okay, so uh, imagine. Th so let's discuss now the proper way to. So the the proper way to compute, for example, a two-point function in this theory, uh, in the SYK model. So we are interested in computing the two-point function, let's say, uh, and we would like to compute it. Th then we compute the two-point function for fixed couplings, and then we like to do the average uh, over the j's, right? So. That's what we would like to compute. And this is equal, uh, just by definition of what we are doing here, is the integral dj of e to the minus, uh, I'm going to ignore uh, trivial factors, um, integral d psi of e to the, of psi psi e to the s of psi j. Okay? So we have some action that depends on the couplings. We calculate this, we divide by the partition function, so we divide by the integral d psi of e to the s uh, psi j, right? So that's the first bracket. So this whole thing is the first bracket here. Second bracket is this integral over the couplings. And then we can decide if we want it to divide by e to the minus j squared integral dj, right? So that's what we'd like to compute. It, it is different from what we computed because uh, we computed this first average without dividing by the partition function. Right? So we didn't weigh things properly. So we didn't normalize the two-point function properly. So things that have higher partition, values of the coupling that have higher partition functions are contributing more. Right? And they, they shouldn't uh, necessarily contribute more. Right? Um, so they, they are altering the measure for the, the, the j's. Okay, so how do we calculate this, which is the proper thing? Well, first, uh, we could imagine uh, calculating this by adding a source here. Let me call it, uh, well, let me add uh, psi psi sigma, right? And call this a new action that depends also on sigma. And think of this as uh, this whole thing. So this whole thing now can, uh, okay, here, integral dj of uh, d sigma, right? of logarithm of the partition function, so integral d psi of e to the s of uh, psi j sigma, okay? So uh, this is, uh, we want to average over j this log, okay? Uh, e to the minus j squared. Okay, so um, now, um, so log is a complicated function. If we had a power, it would be a little simpler, so if we had uh, integral d psi of e to the minus s uh, j psi sigma to the power n. Uh, that would be an average which, uh, which would be, so if, if, we, if we were doing this average of this times uh, this factor, then this is an average which is more or less a standard uh, field theory average, um, where we think of j as a field, right? But with constant, uh, but it's constant in time. And we have n copies of the original field psi. This li little n copies. No, don't confuse little n with capital N. Okay. Um, but this is not exactly what we want to compute. But this is something that we can compute using standard Feynman diagram standard uh, techniques. Okay. Uh, but then uh, the replica trick consists in taking the limit when n goes to zero okay, of this quantity. 
And so when n goes to zero, um, and then then after we do all these averages, dj, we could take the derivative with respect to sigma. Okay. Um, and so the piece that is non-trivially dependent on sigma and so on and j is the <coughs> the piece that goes here like log of n log of this, right? And then we recover what we had before. Now, don't confuse this replica trick with the replica trick you calculate for entanglement entropy, which involves taking the n going to one limit. So it's somewhat similar. It's the same philosophy, but uh, but this is a slightly different story. OK, good. So that's, uh, that's what uh, the correct calculation is supposed to be. Now, if uh, for some reason uh, this whole uh, answer, uh, the, the answer of doing the path integral, went uh, somehow like a power of n, right? Then we could um, um, then uh, then uh, then we would have done the correct calculation. So what we have to understand is uh, somehow if all this. So okay, let me say it differently. So we have the fermions. So fermions now have uh, an index i from one to one to n, and then an index a that is the replica index. So let me forget this index for a second. So there is a replica index A that goes from 1 to n. And if all the, and so the fermions interact through the Lagrangian with fermions with the same index, right? So all the same index of these vertices. But uh, they could also interact with other fermions, let's say index B, through an exchange of J, okay? So the couplings J, uh, make the replicas, different replicas interact. And to the extent we can neglect the interaction between replicas, then the calculation we did would be correct. So, because here we would um, we would get the, this, this whole partition function is just the product uh, to the nth power of some partition function, of the partition function we calculated, and then that would be the same as what we um, would do anyway. So we have to understand the, the interaction between replicas. So, for example, if we are doing the vacuum diagram, so this is a this is a vacuum diagram of the original theory that went uh, like n, right? So this is, a, and now we have we can have a correction due to interaction between replicas uh, that looks like this, where these are two kinds of uh, two different kinds of replica indexes, right? Um, and well, this uh, this goes. Let's compute. So this goes like j to the fourth over n to the sixth power, right? So this diagram, um, so n is how the leading answer goes. So now we're going to try to compute how this correction to the free energy would go. So it goes like this. Um, and uh, and um, so we have now to sum over uh, all these indices. But notice that because of this contraction, these two indices are correlated. So we have just an n to the fourth, right? So we have. Um, so this is the contribution of this diagram. And in order to compute the relative contribution relative to this, we just divide this by n, right? Because that was the leading contribution. So this is how much or less important this one is. And uh, this goes like 1 over n cubed, OK? So corrections to the discussion we had due to uh, this average over couplings goes like 1 over n cubed, OK? Um, OK, good. So uh, I think uh, oh, I'm over time. So Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Um, um, no, I really can't comment. So. <laughs> I, I, I know this argument, uh, assuming uh, analyticity. And certainly in cases where the corrections are small, we are almost checking that uh, <coughs> the limit is given. So I'm only presenting the argument to show that um, uh, in the case where we are talking about, it's not important. But uh, this uh, whole uh, replica method and so on, well, has lots of uh, different aspects. Uh, so we can consider solutions, for example, which uh, preserve the replica symmetry, have correlations between replicas, some that where you you break the symmetry between, I mean, the permutation symmetry between the <coughs> replicas, and there is a whole interesting subject there related to spin glasses and so on. 
But certainly I don't know uh, to what extent you can justify this uh, analyticity then. I mean, of course, if you have finite number of degrees of freedom, you, you can. But of course, there is a capital N here that we're also taking large. Yeah. So uh, when you perform the disordered average over J yes. for the SYK model, so you got like uh, there was a shy i of E and a shy i of E prime. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, so each of them should have a replica index. Yes, 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 yes. So the the derivation basically goes the same. So you can do the derivation if you look at the papers. They they are done with the replicas. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's uh, it's it's the same. And at some point you say, well, I'm going to assume that my correlators are replica diagonal. And then uh, you get the same answer that we discussed. So the replica is of like when we are saying that we are considering a replica, it's like it's like a, a replica of the entire system of this Majorana fermions. Yeah, the right. important thing, yeah, we 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 replicate the Majorana fermions. We do not replicate the J's. There is only one set of J's, and yeah, that's that's the that's the replica trick. Um, um, well, I, I think it just depends on how much you're going to change the distribution. So, I mean, if, if it has some small non-Gaussian corrections, it's not important. But uh, if, uh, I don't know, you take the J's to be uh, all equal or something, then you take very special structure for the J's, then you'll get a different spectrum. So, for example, um, let me give you a little example that uh, we looked at in detail. So you can choose the spectrum J i J k l to be equal to something like Q a um, i j something like this. I don't remember the precise formula. And you assume that the Qs are random variables, right? So this affects the distribution. So now we don't have a Gaussian distribution for the Js. We assume that let's say the Qs are uh, Gaussianly distributed. And then the, the shape of the spectrum and so on changes. The, the details change, the, the two-point functions change, and so on. But it's just a, I would call this a fairly drastic modification of the, of, the, of the distribution. This, by the way, is uh, what you get if you, that there's a supersymmetric version of the model, and this is what the J's have, the distribution of the J's. <coughs> Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, the original sash the VM model was uh, a little more complicated model where the J's have some spe special structure. They were not as generic as the ones we are discussing here. Um, and then that model has uh, various phases. So it has a phase where it behaves uh, as what we discussed so here. Uh, it has the same properties, but then it has some other phase where it looks like a spin glass and this replica story is more important. So. Um, Maybe I should mention a little bit what the uh, the original search the model was. I mean, just search for completeness. So, mentioned? Okay, fine. Not necessary. Oh, good, good. Yeah. No. I think. Why, why repeat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay, sure. Ah, ah, okay, so then. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it was. Well, when when Sash they originally uh, was saying about this, I, I I thought it wasn't interesting because the, in the condom model, you know, you have the bulk which is the CFT, and then you have these impurities. It wasn't the case where you just have the impurities themselves. I hadn't realized that you didn't have the bulk when. 
yeah, I 